President Biden is in the Middle East this week, and the White House itself has now confirmed what we've already really known, that President Biden will meet with Saudi King Salman and his son, the notorious crown prince, during his visit to the kingdom. This after weeks of hemming and hawing. I'm not going to meet with him. I'm not going to meet with him yet. I'm going to an international meeting. I guess I will see the, the king and the crown prince. But that's, that's not the meeting I'm going to. They'll be part of a much larger meeting. He'll have a bilateral discussion uh, with, uh, with the king and, and the king's leadership team. In Saudi Arabia, the president will meet with the Saudi leadership with an aim to strengthen our partnership and also hold bilateral meetings with a number of other Middle Eastern leaders. Yes, the president of the United States is going to meet with MBS, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who, lest we forget, ordered the murder of Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi, according to U.S. intelligence, and is also the guy who has orchestrated the years-long brutal siege of Yemen. You might be thinking, wait, didn't Biden say it was embarrassing when Trump met with MBS? The answer is yes, he did. So how can the president justify visiting the kingdom and visiting the prince himself, visiting Saudi Arabia, a country he once called a pariah? Well, in the Washington Post last week, in the Post of all papers, President Biden explained that Saudi Arabia's energy resources are vital for mitigating the impact on global supplies of Russia's war in Ukraine. Biden also lists actions taken against the Saudis, saying that these punishments prove the United States will not tolerate extraterritorial threats and harassment against dissidents and activists. But energy experts say the meeting is unlikely to drive down gas prices, with one telling The Hill, quote, there is no way that Saudi Arabia has the ability to produce as much oil as the world has lost because of the Russian embargo. So won't photos of Biden making nice with MBS completely delegitimize the White House's so-called zero tolerance policy towards harassment? Well, it appears Team Biden has already thought about that. They say he will avoid handshakes with all leaders to prevent COVID spread. Conveniently a move that also helps Biden avoid shaking MBS's hand. Assuming, of course, the Saudis miss this handshake with a certain indicted former Israeli prime minister on Wednesday. But even if MBS doesn't get his handshake on camera, I'm sure the Saudis will be plenty satisfied with the legitimacy and the clout they'll gain from what many would argue is, from a U.S. perspective, at best an ill-advised meeting, at worst a downright shameful one. Joining me now are Khalid al-Jabri, the son of former Saudi spymaster Saad al-Jabri and brother of Sara and Omar al-Jabri, whom he claims MBS has held hostage since 2017. And back with us is MSNBC political analyst Peter Beinard. Uh, Khalid, thanks for joining us. I want to play you a clip of your father, Saad al-Jabri. This is how he describes Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. I am here to sound the alarm about a psychopath killer in the Middle East with infinite resources, who poses threat to his people, to the Americans, and to the planet. A psychopath with no empathy, doesn't feel emotion, never learned from his experience. And we have witnessed atrocities and crimes committed by this killer. And Khalid, you and your father say he's not just a killer and a psychopath. You also say he's a hostage taker. Tell us about your siblings back home in Saudi Arabia and what is happening to them. Uh, thank you for having me in your show, Mandy. Uh, so Omar and Sara, uh, when they were 17 and 18, uh, on MBS's first day as Crown Prince, uh, became hostages. He prevented them from leaving the kingdom to join their schools in Boston. And then later, when they first there, missed their first week of school, uh, my father pleaded with MBS directly. Uh, and in WhatsApp text messages, he effectively blackmailed my dad, telling him, I want to solve this issue of your son and daughter, but there's a file here related to the previous crown prince. Uh, so unlike Khashoggi, where MBS deflected on rogue agents, he's been micromanaging the hostage situation of my siblings since 2017. Uh, last month, the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention investigated their forced disappearance uh, and uh, declared that their detention was unlawful, arbitrary. Uh, they declared the treatment that they received in disappearance uh, as, as, as torture. They referred their cases to both the Working Group on Forced Disappearance and the Special Rapporteur 
uh, on torture. It's been an ongoing mayhem uh, for uh, five years where a couple of uh, teenagers uh, had their lives and dreams dropped uh, by the Saudi crown prince. Uh, um, and that's evolved yeah. into a transnational repression campaign against uh, my father and his family. We're so sorry to hear about your siblings, and thank you for sharing that with us. Peter, the argument in D.C. is often, well, it's not about human rights. It's about the fact that we need oil to come down. We need the price to come down. We need cheaper gas. And yet the consensus among energy experts is that even from a strategic, self-interested perspective, this meeting will not lower gas prices. The Saudis don't have the unilateral power to do that. So what is the upside for Biden in meeting with them, especially because this, I want to play it for you, Peter. This is how Biden himself described Saudi Arabia just three years ago on the campaign trail. Have a listen. And I would make it very clear, we were not going to, in fact, sell more weapons to them. We were going to, in fact, make them pay the price and make them, in fact, the pariah that they are. So why go now and basically humiliate himself? I think actually a lot of it has to do with this fear that we are going, the U.S. is going to lose Saudi Arabia to the Russians or the Chinese. They will not remain America's ally. Um, this is, as you will know, this is a return to kind of the Cold War logic, which basically says no matter what a dictator does to his own people or even to people around the region, we can't. We need to keep them on our side, no matter how much destruction they they wrought, they they they, they produce, because the world is a global chessboard. Our side against their side. And I think that, you know, it's not just that, that Biden is going to meet with MBS. The reports are the U.S. is seriously considered a resumption of offensive weapons. We never cut off all weapons to Saudi Arabia. We made this kind of artificial distinction between defensive and offensive. But now we're going to scrap that. We're going to send off sell offensive weapons, it appears now, even to this man, even after what he's done Ugh. in Yemen, even after Saudi Arabia's role, which has been disastrous throughout the entire region. Is this really something that an administration that says human rights rights is at the center of its foreign policy can possibly justify? Uh, I think we all know the answer to that question. Hala, <laughs> let me ask you this. If you could speak to if you could speak to President Biden, would you be telling him to not visit Saudi Arabia, to not visit MBS? Or would you be saying go, but call him out while you're there? Call him out over my siblings, call him out over human rights abuses? Before the Biden administration announced the visit, I wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post basically urging the Biden administration to fix the relationship with Saudi Arabia, but not at all cost. Uh, unfortunately, right now, as it stands, it looks like, you know, Biden is going with lopsided one-way concessions, and that's only going to harm the relationship going forward. We already saw in front of our eyes what happened after the last president visited Saudi and embraced an MBS. It unleashed the pattern yeah. of destructive regional behavior and uh, egregious human rights violations, uh, most notably Colin. the murder of a U.S. resident. And uh, many I've U.S. citizens are hostages. We're running out of time, and I have to jump in and just put something to you. It's an awkward question, but I have to ask it. What would you say to people who say, you and your family may be opposed to MBS now and in favor of reform in Saudi Arabia, human rights, but for years, your father was part of the system. He enforced the brutal Saudi dictatorship as the top spy chief, and it's only now that MBS is against him that you're speaking out. What would you say in response to those critics who make that point? I would uh, let them basically point them towards uh, public uh, uh, statements made by multiple officials about the role that my father played when it comes to saving thousands of Saudi and American lives. Actually, some of the attack points by the MBS regime at that point is my dad was too dovish. He was about rehabilitating extremists and being uh, basically uh, the person who had the reconciliation mentality. Um, so, you know, he's actually being attacked for being too soft and, 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 uh, and not showing the same kind of, of uh, iron fist that MBS is doing at the moment. Um, that's how would I answer their, their critique. Fair enough. Thank you for taking that question. We're out of time, but Peter, I've got to ask you about something related to all of this. Former Trump national security advisor John Bolton admitted on television on Tuesday to planning multiple attempted coups. Have a listen. One doesn't have to be brilliant to attempt a coup. Uh, I disagree with that. As somebody who has helped plan coup d'etat, yeah. not here, but, you know, other places, uh, it takes a lot of work. You and I say this stuff, we're ridiculed <laughs> for being anti-American or left-wing conspiracy theorists. John Bolton's just bragging about it on TV. 
Right. And he's bragging about it because he knows he has utter impunity, because he knows that Congress is not going to do anything, that the media is still going to have him on for these, these interviews. And because the America has tried to wreck the International Criminal Court, he will be never be held to international standards of justice, which in a better world he would be.